listen. When the Spirit of God comes into the room, you don't have to wait to give Him praise. A lot of times we don't understand the difference between jumping or praising and worshiping. If we can just think about how good God has been to each and every one of us, that makes us want to say, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The words to the song. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Whether it's some fast or slow, we're still telling him, thank you. Hallelujah. So just in this moment right now, if you can just think how good God has been to you, that's the reason why we say thank you. If you can just think what he's done for you just this week or even just this morning, we begin to say thank you. When we see how he's healed our bodies in many ways financially, we begin to say thank you. Hallelujah. So just for one minute, can we do another stanza of that song? And I want you to sing it like you mean it. It's not for me, but it's for you. It's your way of giving him honor and glory. We're saying thank you for just being good. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being there. Hallelujah. He's worthy of all the praise. Hallelujah. Let's sing it one more time. Say thank you, Lord. and be able to celebrate the accomplish accomplishments and the things that they do. Hallelujah together. Because listen, we're not by ourselves. No man is an island. We're all together. Fitly joined together, we are a family. 
Today I want to just put a thought in your hearts and your minds, and I promise that I will not be before you long. It is actually one o'clock. Right now, is that one o'clock? Amen. It's one o'clock. I thank God for um, the understanding of who he is and who he is to me. And I encourage everyone to get to know your purpose and what God has called you to do because many of us have been in church a long, long time, and many years, and you still question what have I been called to do. And the calling doesn't always have to be preaching, doesn't always have to be singing, but you can sign it because you are like to someone. Someone has to see the Christ in you. And we all are ambassadors for Christ. When we have turned our will over to him and received the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, after the Holy Ghost has come, you shall receive power. So I'm, I'm encouraging you this morning, let's learn how to activate the power that's within us. There's a thought that came to my mind and um, we talk about outreach all the time and we talk about winning souls for Christ. But there's something that has been pressing on my spirit for a good while. And that is we have to evaluate why we do what we do as Christians. But always know that ministry begins in your hearts. It starts at home. How many of you, by the show of hands, have children? If you have children, raise your hand. Good. How many of you have grandchildren? Good. Amen. How many of you are single parents? Meaning that you have a single parent household at this time right now. Okay. There's a reason why I'm going there because the thought that I want to leave you is that it's time to focus on the family. It's time to focus on the family. We're talking about our spiritual family, and we're also talking about our personal family. There's something that comes to mind that says we need to forgive and forget. A lot of times when we have experiences in life and some of those things that were enjoyable, sometimes we do push them in the back and we want to forget them, but then some things that we should forget, we hold on grudgingly, because we felt we've been done a disservice and instead of forgiving that person, we want to hold a grudge because they never came back and apologized. But at some point, we have to realize that don't you know if you hold a grudge and if you keep malice in your heart, you're not hurting the person, you're hurting yourself. Forgiveness is something that is not always easy to do but it's something that is important and that is necessary in order for you to grow and move to the next dimension of where God is taking you. It's time to grow. It's time to grow. Things are shifting around us as we look and for years we've heard that the Lord was soon to come and we look at things that are happening around us and guess what? Life is going to continue to happen. But it's how you as an individual process what happens around you. Are you a child of the king? Are you victorious? Are you an overcoming? Can you say, I am strong? Can you say, I am healed? Can you say, I am blessed and highly favored? When Moses had asked, well, who would I say sent me? He said, I am that I am. But if the great I am dwells within you, don't you know that you have that power to decree and declare that I am healed and I am strong and that I am blessed and that my family is saved? Do you know that you have that power? Yes or no? <laughs> Amen. So anyway, I'm going to read this passage of scripture really quickly and then I'm going to just cover a few points. But before I do that, I want you to just think right now in your seat where you are. There was something else that I wanted to do and I'm not going to do that. Um, I find that when we are close together, when people are, okay, I'll put it like this. Sometimes you'll see a restaurant that is always full with people and the place is not that big. 
So we question and we say, well, why don't they get a larger space? Because don't you know that when things are filled to capacity, that people get more excited for some reason because it looks like it's a lot. You understand what I'm saying? So, and I'm just saying this, I gotta put this in the air because it's in my spirit. Don't you know that when we come into the house of God, that we should gather close, serve together, and be more unified together? Because as I'm looking up in the room, I see people scattered. And it's okay, because that's the seat that you chose. But it would be so much more overwhelming if everybody was all together. That's just my opinion. But I do know that when there's unity and there's togetherness and camaraderie, you get a different result. Are y'all on the same page? Y'all know where I'm going? Amen. Amen. But anyway, I'm going to move and I'm going to go right to my scripture. I just had to say that. That's my disclaimer of today. Unity in the community. Where there's unity, there is shit. But we want to focus on the family because there's families that are here. And I'm so proud to be a part of Refuge because I know the legacy and I know where it started even before we moved into this building. But one thing that I can say is I look back over the history. The blessings that has always blessed Refuge is that we had large families that were connected to Refuge. We had a whole bunch of children. We had a lot of people that grew up here and been here mostly all your life. But that unity and that close-knit family structure took us through. And we want to refocus and say, how can we bring that back? Is that okay? Do, do you agree that we need to get back to the unity of the family? Or, or am I talking wrong? Please let me know. Because this is what he gave me today. We have to focus on the unity of the family. Let me go into my scripture. Our scripture is coming from Genesis the 18th chapter and the 10th through the 19th verse. And I may jump around just a little bit, but like I said, I'm, um, I just want to bring out some point, points and I promise that I will take my seat. But God is saying it's time to unify we want to do outreach and there's nothing wrong with that, but ministry begins at home. Don't you know your children are a product of you? Whatever you set as rules and standards in your house, that's what they're going to carry to the streets. And they represent you. Okay, so if we say we represent the king, it begins at home. Amen. So our scripture is coming from Genesis, the 18th chapter, and we're starting at the 10th verse. And it says, and my Bible may be just a little differently. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure especially when my, my master, my husband, is also old. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can, why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, you did that. Starting at the 17th verse, and it says, no, I'm going to read up because I'm sorry, 16. Then the men got up from the mill and looked out toward Sodom as they left. Abram went with them to send them on their way. Should I hide my plan from Abraham? The Lord asked. For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from, from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant 
I am going to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. And actually, I read that um, verse, but I didn't want to go there, but I didn't want to read it anyway. When you got glasses and you're trying to strain the seat, <laughs> you just want to keep them in the flow. But where I'm at with this is that Abraham and Sarah, at this time she was barren, and we know the story of Abraham and Sarah, but it was promised to them that she would bear a child. And it was also promised that Abraham would be great and that he would be the father of many nations. But what I want us to realize is that we come from greatness. And that greatness has to be passed down to our families and the history. That's the reason why we celebrate our elders because a lot of times they have to share with us the things that we were too young to understand or the things that we should understand where our foundation comes from so that we know what we're building upon knowing that history is real and that the history of your family and the history of your church family it gives you greater direction of who you are as an individual because we all are a byproduct of our surroundings we are a byproduct of our environment so if we say that we are prosperous and that we are a child of the king there should be no lack because you know who you are and you know what was declared to you so if we know that we were made in the image of God, don't you know that you have power to speak things into existence? You have power to know that whatever the circumstance may be, I don't have to throw my hands up in defeat, but I know that if I can decree and declare that it turns in my favor, then it is so. But that's only when you believe, and that's why we go back to our belief system. We have to know who we are and who we believe in. We have to know that after the Holy Ghost has come, you have received, you shall receive power. You have power to overcome. He has not given us the spirit of fear, so why do we fear? When we look at our families, again, the word forgive and forget is something that we have to reevaluate. If we come here Sunday in and Sunday out and we sing songs and we clap our hands and we give our testimonies, but then after we leave out of those doors, there's no victory, then there's a problem. That means that we don't really understand the concept of what we have and who we are and what the Lord has given us. Our assignment and our only assignment is to be able to turn our will over to God, that is by allowing the Holy Ghost to come in into our lives, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, renewing our minds back to God. Because what happened was when men disobeyed, that's what took us out of fellowship. But we know that Christ came and became the ultimate sacrifice. But before he died on the cross, they had to have sacrifices of lamb's blood and all of these things and, and the priest going into the Holy of Holies and if he wasn't right, they had a rope attached to him and if he dropped dead, they could drag him out. All of those things. But when Jesus Christ was hung, not hung, nailed to the cross and he died as the ultimate sacrifice, he was God wrapped in the flesh. He had that ultimate plan because even though man disobeyed, he didn't stop there and throw us away. He knew that he had to bring us back into fellowship with him. And it is just that easy. Turn your will back to him. So the focus on the family part that I'm trying to get you to understand is that stop giving up on your family. What examples are we setting in front of our loved ones? When we say we want to do outreach, we're outreaching because we want to share the good news of what God has done for us, but the question is, do we share that with our families? So, there's many restrictions that we bring about when we talk about living holy, and with everything, there's rules and there's regulations. But the most important thing that God wants us to understand is that our ultimate goal is to encourage men and women to turn their will back to God. And how is that done? Okay. Once we receive the Holy Ghost, and I know what I'm talking about, you see, I grew up here. I grew up here just like a whole, all of us, most of us. I grew up here. And I know what I was taught. 
But I do understand that as we mature and get to know God for ourselves, there's a break in revelation. So what happens is that, yes, the, the Christ that was presented to us as children was presented to us from the adults and the leaders at that time. Now, we say the foundation does not change, and that's true. But the presentation has to shift sometimes based upon the mindset of where the people are. So what I'm saying is that we have to use the power to know that even if we see a roadblock, know that we can tunnel through because that's our faith. If you know that someone that you witness to or you talk to, you don't like what they're doing, but you get discouraged because they're not listening to you, don't you know that the power of prayer intercessory can go where you can? But what we do, we get frustrated because we want instant gratification. We want to see them change instantly. But unfortunately, that's not going to always happen. And that's why we have to be wise enough to know that if we are introducing Christ, first of all, it can't be introduced with scare tactics. And it can't be introduced in the way that we're reprimanding someone. Don't you know you need to be saved? Don't you know you need to stop wearing that? Don't you know you... That's her that come down, this and that, and we understand those things. But what happens with people that that's not where their mind is? Your mind is there because that's what you're following. But what happens when that person is not there yet? Do we stop talking to them? Do we throw them in the garbage? Do we distance ourselves and say, you know what, I can't be around you because you're not trying to adapt and adjust? That means that you're dropping the ball. That means that your mission is not accomplished. That means that somewhere you need to go back to the drawing board. The Bible says, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. The Bible also says, he that went the soul is wise. So if you can look around this room real quick, everybody just do a quick glance of the room. Look around the room. Okay? Everybody in here has family members. Everybody in here has young people attached to them. Everybody in here has children attached to them. Everybody in here has neighbors and, and co-workers. So the question is, if you were to invite them to come and fellowship with you, what is the hindrance of why they don't want to come? Can y'all answer? I'm just getting you to think. Why can't we Convince people to come and fellowship with us. It's just to get you to think. First of all, whenever you want change, it begins with you. Whenever I want change, I can't complain about what somebody else is doing or pointing out somebody else's flaws. I gotta fix myself first. Right? We have to be first partakers. So when we're talking about family again, if you're a Christian and you love God and you have unsafe family members that are living in your house and you have unsafe children, spouse, whatever, don't you know that the life that you live in front of them either influences them or turns them off? Right or wrong? Amen. So how do we become more effective in what we're supposed to do with our assignment, and again, our assignment is to help men and women turn their will to God. Mm. I'm gonna give you a few sayings, and a lot of times we see those plaques that people place on the wall in their house. Um, you go in the bathroom or the kitchen, you got these nice little paintings or wood carvings that got all these family sayings on it. So I just want to read a few for you. Might have heard them, may not have, but just stay on the train where I'm going. Sayings, family sayings. A family that prays together stays together. You ever heard that? Yeah. Family where life begins and love never ends. Every family has a story. Welcome to ours. Faith makes all things possible. Love makes all things easy. Hope makes all things work. Family makes life worth living. These are things that we always say because we want to bring unity. 
But God is asking in this season that not only do we unify our family structure, He wants us to begin to just reach out more. But we can't reach anybody if we can't reach our own families. Ministry starts at home. Your children, when they hit the streets, now I've worked in the school system in New York for five years, and when I see children acting out of order or doing certain things, a lot of times I try to analyze, well, if I have to teach the lesson and the child is not paying attention, do I just throw all my attention to the students that always raise their hand and always ask the question? Or do I get rid of the kids that are in the room that want to keep talking and not pay attention? Or do I begin to use wisdom and see how I can kind of get the interest of those that aren't interested by shifting my curriculum? And sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes the plan of action can be planned out one way. But as you begin to implement what you put together, sometimes when things don't work, what do we do? We tweak it until it works, right? Amen. So what happens with that is that whatever the mission is, when we're saying we love God, and, I, and now don't, don't get me wrong, because everything I'm saying to you, I'm saying to me. Okay, the word goes back and forth. Um, and I, I just say that as a disclaimer because everybody that hears the word of God going forth, guess what? The leaders have to take responsibility too. If God gives us a word, it's not just for you, it's for me too. You know, so, so never take anything personal to feel like somebody's picking on you because they're not. It's for all of us. It's about learning and growing. How many of you want to grow? Amen. How many of you want to go to the next level? Yes. Hey, y'all saying it. How many? How many of you, by the show of hands, really want to see God flip this thing around for us? Amen. And when we say that, we have to mean it. Because you know what? When you say something and you begin to fill it in your spirit, it promotes action. So you can say something all day long, but if you don't feel it or mean it, there's no movement. But when you're excited about something, just like when you first received the Holy Ghost, you got excited. You wanted to just tell everybody how you felt and what was going on. But then what happens as it got <coughs> normal and complacent and the excitement was gone. But how do we rekindle that excitement? Don't you know that if you're not excited about something, then nobody else will be excited? Don't you know if you're not excited about your place of worship and where you come, nobody else is going to be excited? Because we vibe, as that word vibe, <laughs> we vibe off the energy of one another. And that's the reason why when it's time for corporate fellowship, everybody need to be up here. Not just one or two. Praise worship leaders and devotional leaders are not here to pump you. They're here to lead you into worship, but it's up to you to get out what you need. And if you don't get nothing, that's because you didn't put nothing in. Right or wrong? So going back to the family, if we can do this, just real quickly, do it and challenge yourself. And I'm going to throw some questions out right now. And I know that this is a little unusual, but I'm sorry, this is how I preach. I don't move and scream and all of that. That's just me. And that's not knocking anybody that do. I'm just saying this is my presentation. So I hope it's okay. Is it okay? Amen. <laughs> So anyway, what, what I want you to just think about as I say these things. Do I exhibit love to my friends and family? Is it just in words or is it in action? Do I cut myself off from my friends and family because I'm not pleased with what they do? And I think they should be doing something else. Am I frustrated because I ask them to do certain things and it don't seem like they're getting it or want to do it? So I just give up and say, you know what, it's okay, I'm going to stop trying. Um, um, uh, let the Lord have his way. Uh, you know, whatever the Lord says. Is that fair to God? 
Because when you said these things, when I go home and said this, and let the world will be done, that means you're talking out of frustration. And that means that you don't believe that you can turn things around. Sarah didn't believe that she can have a baby. Right? That's what the scripture said. And then she laughed because she said, what are you talking about? I'm 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 having a baby. He's gonna come back and get it from now and I'm have <laughs> She thought it was funny. Then she got a break because the, the, the men, the three men that came, he asked, did you laugh? And then she said, no. But in actuality, she didn't laugh, but she was fearful. But God so honored what he said that he was going to do for them. So we know that God's mercy is great, but guess what? When you receive knowledge, knowledge is power. When we get a greater understanding of our assignment and what we should be doing, what we do, we do better. Or we implement it because God is asking us. We want to see people saved. We want to see the move of God and the power of God, but it starts within us. If we're not operating in our gifts freely and excited about being used by God, it's not going to happen. The Holy Ghost does not even force you to be saved. Or if you have to yield your will. Many times the, the Spirit of God will lead us in the right direction not to do something and we decide we want to do it anyway. But I'm here to tell you on this morning that God is calling us to action. And ministry starts first at home with the family. So can we become more prayerful and more patient and more loving? And, and, and we're talking about our personal family, but I'm talking about even our church family. How many of you in here really interact with each other during the week or you just see each other on Sunday morning? How many of you in here really know your sister or your brother that's next to you? You know where they live, you know their telephone number, or, or you know what their occupation is? You'll be surprised of people that don't know. There's people that come and fellowship with you right here every Sunday. You don't know if they have a wife or husband, children, siblings, nothing. You only know them, why did you only see them? Am I right? Amen. And it's not just here. Like I said, I'm not just talking about refuge, I'm talking about everywhere. The body of Christ has to become more united. Where there's unity, there's strength. It's time to raise up. It's time to really unite. But let's get ourselves together first before we hit the outside. Let's get our house together. Our personal house, our personal family, our personal children. Let's get them together first so that we can fill this place up that we can touch somebody else. Because we have to stop trying to reach a stranger when you can't even reach the people that's in front of you. What are we doing? And if this is not a reprimand, this is just a thinking session. Where are we? What are we doing? Are we really on our assignment? God is calling for us to stand up. He's calling for us to be a light to the world. Let's stop complaining about what's happening on the news and, and what's not this and what's not that. What can you do to make it better? Love has to rule and super rule in everything that we do. Don't you know if you keep your demeanor pleasant, meaning that you find a way to stay happy every day, and it becomes a part of you, don't you know that when people start coming around you, they'll start saying, well, wow, that person is happy. Wow, that person is, is wow. Wow, what's different about them? I, I, wow, I want to be like them. Misery, misery loves company. And as a child of the king, you should never be miserable. I'm, I'm sorry, we do know that life happens, but that's the joy of the Lord that should come in, how we shift out of the misery and, 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 and turn it over to the joy of the Lord. That's because we should have hope. If we have the Holy Ghost living within us, no matter what your situation is looking like, and yes, our human side says, I want to give up, I can't do it, X, Y, Z. But that's why we also have to be accountable for one another because when Sandra needs strength, I can call her and empower her. And when I need strength, I can call on somebody and know they got my back. Because every day is not going to be up here. But we can strive to make it be that way. And God is calling for us to really not just come to church, but let's be the church, which is the body of Christ. This is not the church. This is the building. 
But we are the church. Whether in this room or not, we're the church. We're ambassadors. We're representatives. But at some point, and my time is up, my 30 minutes is up, at some point, just as a thought, this week alone, I encourage your hearts. I encourage you. I hope you have gotten something. I hope the Lord has kept you on the shoulder. If he's brought something for you to analyze and to look at. How effective are we as Christians? How, who are we touching? Who are we changing? Do we need to go back and reset ourselves? Do we need to be recalibrated? Do we have love in our heart? Can we forgive and forget? Can we forgive and forget? Can we forgive and forget? Do you love God? Because he loves you. Do you love your family? Because they really love you. And a lot of times, do you know what? And I'm going to share this with you and I'm going to go take my seat. Don't give up on your family members. The young people, the old, whoever it may be, brothers, sisters, uncle, aunts. Don't see them. Jesus. Don't see them in the state that they're in right now. But see them delivered. See them whole. Don't you know that God has given us the ability, and it's so, it's so amazing that after we become adults, we just, I don't know, our thinking just turns in a whole other direction, maybe because there's so many things we have to face as adults, but children are in an innocent place. And once you lose that innocence, it's like their life just gets jacked up and lets you take charge of your life. That's why you gotta live on purpose. And have the purpose of everything that you do each day should make sense and have purpose. So the point that I'm saying is that you gotta imagine. When you can, that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You gotta imagine in your mind and see them whole. You got to imagine in your mind and see your family unified. You got to imagine in your mind and imagine and see it and begin to just thank God, Lord, I see it. I see it. I see it. I'm excited because I see it. I know you're going to do it. I see it. That's what our faith does. Use it. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on those that used to be here. I ask you another question. This is just my own personal view. I don't like when people call people backsliders. I don't. That's just me personally. Because sometimes we say it, but we say it with such nastiness that we throw the people in the garbage like they have the plan. But don't you know that God hasn't given up on them? And you shouldn't either. But what we have to do is sometimes rephrase our wording. And yes, the Bible says backslide and all that, but don't you know that words are powerful? And we don't know how words um, affect people. And we can't wear our salvation as a badge of honor like we got it all together and we've been perfect. Because even since we've known him, we haven't been perfect. So at some point, how do we love on those that may have got wounded? How do we love on them and let them know that God loves you? I don't have to beat you up and keep saying, oh, you need to come back to church. No, I just have to say, you know what, I'm praying for you. Let me give you a hug. Are you okay? Is everything all right? You don't always have to be telling people what to do because they already know. Hallelujah. Jesus. All you have to do is love them. And, and even in my own family, I have nieces and nephews and sisters and brothers. And, and I thank God that as we've gotten older, those seeds that my mother planted in us were all coming back together in unity. After my father died three years ago, we um, started a, um, it's a, it's a text, a group text, where we all text each other every morning. We're in different states. Then we do the Marco Polo where we, you know, live stream whatever we're doing and we document everything that we're doing. And I thank God that I implemented it three years ago and it's still going strong and it's brought us closer together. Whatever it takes to bring your family together, do it. Stop feeling like, oh, I can't go over to your house because y'all smoke and drink and I'm, and I'm saved and I'm holy or, or, or y'all going to be cursing and this and that. Guess what? Can I tell you something? If you respect people, they'll respect you. Yeah, amen. Right. amen. If you come so 
pompous and, and special and perfect and make them feel uncomfortable, they ain't gonna come around you. Because you've already, without saying it, already put yourself up here like I'm better than you. It's real. It's true. So how do we change that? That even in wherever they are, because guess what? Intercessory prayer goes where we can. Sometimes just be silent, don't say nothing. But pray. Prayer is what changes things. And we can't save them anyway. God has to touch the heart. But they have to see the God in us. And if they don't see the God in us, then what are we doing when we come in here amongst ourselves? I always say, why do you turn the light on in a lit room? It makes no sense. If the room is lit already, why am I turning the lights on? Floodlights. So why can't we go in the places that really need to see our light? Why can't we go to the barbecue where they, they, they um, Dropping it like it's hot, you know, and all the whole nothing. You know what I mean? Because really that says something about us, because don't you know that if you're really walking in your power and anointing, you can go anywhere. And it will not change you. Why? Because you're focused on your mission. So if you are that weak and you feel you can't be around certain things, please don't. Stay in the house. Stay on your knees. Only you know where you are. But at some point, we have to build up that strength to know that we can be a light in a dark place. That people can see the difference in us and say, God, what is it that they have that I don't have? Focus on the family. Focus on your loved ones. Know that God is in control of all things. And he's asking us not just come. It ain't about just worshiping and coming together and doing the same thing over and over and over again. Because if we're not seeing no results, then it's called lunacy. Anytime you keep doing something over and over again and there's no growth and you see no results, that's called crazy. It really is. And anything that's not growing is either retarded or is dead. So at some point, don't you want to see growth? Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm done. But I thank God for this opportunity. I thank God for Pastor Johnson. I thank God for each and every one of you that have been instrumental in my life growing up. And friends, family, all of us, we are the church family. My last words is that, guess what? We got to come together in unity and strength. I was listening to uh, Elder Ward. I was about to say Jason. <laughs> I was listening to Elder uh, Warden who was talking about the outreach. And I think that it, it is a commendable thing to want to do things on the outside. And that's a good thing. But we also have to work on the inside. And, and, and the inside is really the most important place. Because you can't do nothing effectively out there if you ain't got together in here. And, and, and our families need us. They need us. We need to see more young people in here than we see. We need to see more families in here than we see young families. Gerard should not be the only family or, or even Elder Ward or even Elder Jackson. Those shouldn't be the only families with young children. We should see a whole bunch. And the older people, I thank God for you. I was saying our seniors. We're listen, I'm 54. A few more years, 10 more years, I'll be 64. 20 more years, I'll be 74. So trust me, time is not waiting for any of us. But everybody has a purpose. The older people, it's time for you to begin to pour more into the young women. The deacons, pour more into the young men. You guys have been in the way a long time. Share that knowledge that God has given you. Those triumphs and those victories that you face growing up as, as women, women of God, it's time to share. It's time to take people under their wings and, and Minister to those young women that need ministering to. Is that okay? Amen. We're not supposed to be here just to look at each other and say, wow, what comes next? <laughs> what comes next is greater. And greater can't come unless we get on our game, recalibrate, wipe the snake clean, and start all over, forgive and forget. 
Know that God is victorious. He has great things in store for us. How can we empower the community? First, let's be empowered so that we can empower the world. But let's empower our families first. Amen. Can we just close our eyes in prayer?